That's, I think, enough about SCO, truly, though I am delighted to answer your questions in due course about it. It's uh, actually a copyright lawsuit desert. There aren't any copyright claims in it. There are some contract claims between IBM and SCO, and those will in due course be adjusted by the courts, and I look forward with a moderate degree of interest to the outcome. A threat to the freedom of free software, it ain't. One hell of a nuisance, it most certainly is. And I, unfortunately, I expect to continue to spend a good deal of my time abating the nuisance, but without much sense of the presence of a hovering threat to the things I really care about, uh, of which this is not uh, a very good one. So instead I want to ask about the legal future of free software as it actually is, rather than as Mr. McBride sees it, some titanic clash between the American way of life and um, whatever it is we're supposed to be. I should say about that titanic clash between the American way of life and whoever we are that it rings familiar to me. Increasingly, I listen to Mr. McBride and I hear Mr. Balmer, as perhaps you do as well. Uh, that is to say, uh, I treat SCO now as press agentry for the Microsoft monopoly, which has deeper pockets and a longer term concern with what we are doing. Microsoft's a very wealthy corporation, and it could succeed on a business model of software as a public utility surrounded by services in the 21st century. But for all the profound depth of Mr. Gates's mind, the idea of human freedom is one of those things which doesn't register very well with him. And the idea of transforming his business into a service business for reasons that are, I think, accessible to us all doesn't appeal. Uh, therefore, for the survival of the Microsoft monopoly, and I do actually mean its survival, the theory being presented by Mr. McBride that we are doing something horrid to the American way of life must prevail. Regrettably for Microsoft, it won't, because what we are actually doing is more apparent to the world than that propagandistic view will allow for. We, at any rate, have to go on about our business, which is encouraging the freedom of knowledge, and in particular, the freedom of technical knowledge. And in doing that, we have to confront the actual challenges presented to us by the world in which we live, which are in SCO. And so for just a few more moments, I want to talk about those. Software is, in our phrase, free, libre. That is to say, we now have a body of software accessible to everybody on Earth so robust and so profound in its possibilities that we are a few man months away from doing whatever it is that anybody wants to do with computers all the time. And of course, new things are constantly coming up that people would like to do, and they are doing them. In this respect, I say this with enormous satisfaction. In this respect, the free software movement has taken hold and is now ineradicably part of the 21st century. But there are challenges to the freedom of free software which we need to deal with. Patent law, unlike copyright law, presents certain features which are egregious for the freedom of technical knowledge. If the copyright law presents a workable form of the great 18th century ambition of the perfectibility of humankind, the patent law regrettably does not. This is not surprising. 18th century thinkers were a little dubious about the patent law as well. They had a concern for statutory monopolies and a deep history of English law that made them worry about them very much. Patent law in the 21st century is a collection of evil nuisances. There's no question about it. And in the world of software where we exist, there are some particularly unfortunate characteristics uh, of the way that the patent law works. We are going to have to work hard to make sure that the legitimate scope of patent, which is present but which is small, is not expanded by careless administrators any further in the course of the 21st century to cover the ownership of ideas merely because those ideas are expressed in computer programming languages rather than in, say, English or mathematics. 
This is work for us, and it is work for us which a lot of smart lawyers are doing, but they are doing it around the world in various licenses and other legal structures connected with software in inconsistent ways. And the inconsistency among the ways in which lawyers are attempting to cope with the threats posed to software by patents are a serious difficulty for us. We need to conduct a very high-level seminar in the next five years around the world over the relationship between patentability and free software ideas and get square for ourselves what license terms and ways of working minimize the risks posed by patents. There is what I would characterize at the moment as a constructive diversity of views on that subject. But the diversity will have to be thinned a little bit through an improvement of our thought processes if we are, by the end of this decade, to have done what we need to do in subduing the growth of inappropriate patenting in its effect on our particular form of human knowledge enhancement.